last time. So we had defined, so we have F in the Schwartz space, the Adelic Schwartz space. So this was uh, finite linear combinations, finite linear combinations, combinations, um, uh, C linear of uh, functions that look like that are factorizable product over all primes, including infinity FP with uh, F infinity Schwartz in the sense of having all derivatives decaying faster than any polynomial, okay? Uh, all deriv derivatives decay faster than polynomial. Do you want me to spell this out? Sure. Okay, so Schwartz, i.e. for all A and B, there exists a C such that F infinity of X infinity is bounded by C, uh, not just it, but its derivative, its eighth derivative is bounded by C over one plus X to the uh, B, okay, for all, for all X infinity in R, all right? So that's, so all derivatives are bounded. That constant, of course, can depend on A, on the derivative and the, and what the bound you have but I just want it to be decaying faster than polynomial and all of its derivatives fake, decay faster than polynomial. Uh, F infinity Schwartz and FP Schwartz, which means locally constant and compactly supported. And there's one more, there's one more thing that we requested. So what did we say compactly supported was that the, that the support is compact. Literally. Literally, the support is compact and Almost every for almost every p, right? You it should be trivial. It should be what is it? It should be the one. It should be the indic. It should be supported just on zp, literally zp itself, right. and it should be one on zp. Right. So it's just the indicator function of zp. Okay, in which case this product. We, we don't we don't want to deal with uh, issues with convergence of products like this. Sorry, Nick, were you saying something? Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. Okay. So that was the uh, Schwartz space, and we defined for f and for f in the Adelic Schwartz space, we defined the Fourier transform. We had spent all this time building up the uh, Adelic exponential function or a character, the character on the Adels that's trivial on the, uh, that's that's periodic with respect to Q, d mu x, okay? So this is the Adelic Fourier transform with its Fourier inverse. So now we can state the Adelic Poisson summation form. I'm still sort of uh, shocked that this thing is true, even though <laughs> I'm about to prove it for you uh, for F in the Adelic Schwartz space. And we saw, I think we, we discussed last time that this is also in, uh, this is also Schwartz. How often do you use this? The Adelic Poisson summation formula? I mean, do I, how often do I use it in my everyday life? No, 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 no. Because like very often. <laughs> uh, in my research, it arises too. But in my daily life, every day, I use the Adelic <laughs> Um, here's the formula. Uh, okay, so I should tell you, I mean, okay, I'll, let me tell you the classical thing after I write down the, the Adelic one, because the Adelic one is even crazy. <laughs> you take your function and you sum over all rational numbers. First of all, why the hell does this thing converge? You take the Fourier transform and you sum that over all rational numbers. And these two things are the same. These two complex numbers are the same. And they're both always finite. And they, we, have to, we have to prove that, oh, yes, that these things converge. Oh, they both diverge to infinity. So like, yeah. That's it. I just wanted to say that I feel as though writing the sum over these, like if I have a finite sum of, over the integers from like A from zero to N, I yes. could rewrite it as a sum over all integers from minus infinity to infinity of something that is supported on. Yeah. yeah. Where, where between zero and n and zero otherwise. Yes. And that's like the same thing that's happening here. Like because f is Schwartz, I believe that that means that if the denominators are 
Okay, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Yes. But it's not a finite sum. There's still something to do. Yeah. It's not quite a finite sum. But not you're absolutely, finite. it's not a finite sum. It's not, like, it's not like summing over the dense subset of R. It's well, it is summing over <laughs> something that is a dense subset of R, but it's a discrete subset of A, of the adults. Yeah. And so that's what makes this, yes. We have to deal with, like, we have to make sense of this stuff. But before we do that, again, this maybe is I'm motivated by what Andre was, was saying yesterday. What is this stuff good for? I'm realizing that, okay, not everybody, uh, you know, I explained Poisson summation probably in this room, uh, if I remember, a year ago, but that doesn't mean everybody was there and everybody knows what, like, what a Poisson summation good for. So let me, let me remind you that what the classical Poisson summation formula is good for, um, just so that people know where we're, we're going a little bit, let me foreshadow. Uh, and the, the proof of the classical Poisson summation formula, as you'll see, modulo a number of technicalities, will be the same proof, okay? So let's do it in the easier case first. We know what it's good for, and then we can see how the, the same exact proof applies, basically. All right, the classical Poisson summation formula, so we're back to F being Schwartz over the reals, meaning what I, what I wrote just above, okay? Nicely uh, convergent, but not compactly supported. Um, uh, for F in this thing, in this short space, if we take the values of the function and we sum them over the integers, or we take the value of the Fourier transform, I always put a different, I didn't put a different letter in here, <laughs> but they, they genuinely have different meaning. And when you, when you study the trace formula, you see why. Uh, these, two, these two things are, are the same. Okay, so you take some, you take your favorite, whatever, like a Gaussian or uh, anything that's, that's nicely integrable, and you evaluate this just at the integers and you add this thing up. Doesn't have to be, you know, a positive or something. Yeah, you add this thing up. It's going to be convergent. And you take its Fourier transform, which is some other function, some other totally, you know, whatever is going on. And you add its values at the integers. These things have to be the same. This is, this is a crazy fact. It feels insane, that, it feels insane that. that this is true. Okay, so let me, let me show you a proof and then let me show you um, why a, a crazy formula like this is, is I'm sorry, the restriction of the function. Oh, no. Sorry? Wrong, wrong. Okay. Yeah, I'm just taking the function, adding it. It's a real valued function. I'm only going to evaluate it on the integers and add them all up. And similarly, I'll take its Fourier transform, evaluate that on the integers and add those all up. And these two complex numbers are equal. Okay. Let's see why that's true. So proof. So what I'm going to do is make a function called capital F, which is what I like to call an automorphization. So I'm going to automorphize F, meaning take F, apply the group action to your discrete subgroup gamma. Uh, gamma is Z, so this is N in Z. So we have a, if I say gamma, G is R and gamma is Z. Okay, there's a, and in a minute, G will be the Adels and gamma will be the rationals, which is a discrete subgroup of the Adels, okay? So you take this uh, test function that you started with, you automorphize it. Does this function converge? Absolutely. Is it, you know, this thing is smooth, uh, decays faster than anything you like, any polynomial you like. Can I make sense of this? Yeah, so this, this converges nicely, converges, um, uh, nicely, you know, absolutely, absolutely, and continuously, and so on. And um, and this function, this new function, is not a function. It's originally defined for x in the reals, but is really a function on people who don't already know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well. What do I know about f of x plus one? If I shift x by one, that's just renaming the integers. So I get the same sum. So it's really a function on the circle, on the quotient, r mod z, on this nice compact group. It doesn't, doesn't matter that it's uh, a group actually, but it's just a set. The circle is a group, but never mind. This, this works more generally, okay? So now we have this uh, nice locally compact, or in fact, in this case, completely compact uh, space. 
on which we also have a Fourier theory. So on this space, when we have a nice Fourier theory, uh, where we have uh, you know nice continuity, everything's converging absolutely, we can uh, apply apply Fourier analysis on the circle. So what does that tell us? It tells us that I can recover the value of f of x by summing the Fourier transform on the circle of f of s uh, of f of x times the character e to the two pi i. Now, uh, okay, I'll put the minus sign here. This is a sum over all of the spectrum. That's why I like to use a different letter here. This this z is the spectrum, the set of uh, well, the set of eigenvalues of the Laplacian on uh, on the real numbers that's invariant uh, under uh, that's trivial on the that's invariant under the group action of the underlying group of the integers. Okay. Anyway, if, if I'm just planting seeds by saying those words, but never mind if you, if those things don't make sense. Uh, all I'm saying is that you take your function f, you take its Fourier transform, which is an integral over the circle r mod z, f of x e to the two pi i and x. This is the this is the uh, uh, e to the two pi i. Well, whatever the argument is in this case, m x. Okay. This one's with a plus sign. That one's with a minus sign. That's this is Fourier inversion on the circle. Fourier transform, Fourier inversion on the circle. So far, so good. Okay. Now I want to understand this in terms of the original test function little f. Okay. Does it make sense what we're doing? All right. In order to do that, let me. So this function, there's no problem writing r mod z because it's just any fundamental domain, any choice of fundamental domain. Uh, well, this, there's a dx there, of course. This this integral will make sense. Here, there's no dx because we're summing. Um, but let me. Interval of. Yeah, you can take minus a half a half or zero one or or some little piece over there and some little piece over there and a little piece over here, so that the union of those three pieces mod one makes up the whole circle. I don't care what 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 you integrate over here. But they're all equal. What's that? They should be measurable. <laughs> they should be, yeah. That would be a... <laughs> Finite union of intervals, if you like. But okay. Um, so I'm going to fix some fundamental do domain D, some fundamental domain for R mod Z. Okay, so then this, why, why do I want to do such a thing? Well, I'll write out the equation uh, for F. Remember, capital F was the automorphization of little f. So this is a sum over F um, X uh, N in Z. So little f x plus n e to the two pi i m x dx. Okay, all I did is I put in definition, but now you can see this function is certainly not invariant when I replace x by different shifts. So I'd better fix one fundamental domain if I'm going to apply uh, if I want to try to evaluate this. Sum. The total sum doesn't matter; doesn't depend on which which domain you chose. But once I start writing little f, I'd better be clear about where I'm evaluating this. So that's why I fix a domain first. Does that make, does that make sense? This is, uh, for those that haven't seen this before, this is what we're about to do is called the unfolding trick. I'm so ready to swap the intervals. So. That's very good. This is uh, number theory or analysis or whatever you want to call this. Uh, whenever we see two things, we immediately knee jerk uh, your immediate reaction should be these they're in the wrong order. However, you got them, they got to be swapped. So we're going to swap them. Of course, we can by uh, absolute convergence of everything in sight. So there's absolute convergence. So we swap them. And I have an integral over the domain f of x plus n, we have the two pi i mx dx. So far, so good. Let's keep this sum. Here, I'm going to make a change of variables. I'm going to let y equal x plus n. dy is obviously dx because of Har measure, right? So this is Har measure, the invariance of Har measure under the group action. Lebesgue measure is Har measure. Okay, so, so here I'm using Har to say, okay, this is an integral f of y e to the two pi i m instead of x, I have y minus n by the looks of it, dy. 
And the integral now uh, x used to range from zero to one, say. Now I, but x plus n will then range from, uh, well, d plus n, right? As as y ranges over d plus n, that's when x plus n ranges. When x ranges over d, y ranges over d plus n. Does that make sense? Add n inside, add n outside. Yeah, that's right. That's one way of, of thinking about it. But if you just think about what numbers, you know, when x is zero, I want to evaluate yeah. f at n. <laughs> well, I want to evaluate now f at y. So if we're, we were in zero in this domain, we better shift it by n. OK, this is a character. So, and I'm I'm doing this slower than I would normally do it because I want to highlight where at every step what we're going to see when we. Uh, in fact, I might be able to just take all of the N, all of the Z's, and turn them into Q's, or better yet, turn them into gammas, so that this works at the same time in the classical you setting can, as the. You can copy paste it, right? And I can copy paste it, and we can do the same exact argument. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, and then what is this integral? Uh, let's keep the integral the same. Here we have the value of the function. Now this is a character. So the character is an additive character, additive character. So this is e to the two pi i m y times e to the two pi i minus m n. Okay, this is m y and e of minus m n dy. We should probably re-explain the e notation. It's right here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, what do we know about the character? What's e to the two pi i minus m n? Is that m and n are both integers. So. So it's one, yeah, the characters are trivial on, the characters are, uh, yeah, they're periodic with, uh, in Z, in gamma, okay? Character is trivial, is trivial on Z, which is gamma. So, so that's just the one and then dy. But now look at the, in, look at the integrand this has no ends in it. And so summing over, so here's my fundamental domain D, whatever it is. Okay, and then I'm translating D by all the integers. And I'm summing over all possible N, the integral over D plus N. Here, this is D plus N. Isn't that the same thing as integrating over all of R? So this is this is the unfolding step. That the sum over there's no n here. The only thing that's an n is 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 that we're shifting d by the group, by the discrete group. So now I have f of y e to the two pi i m y d y. This is nothing but the real Fourier transform of m of f at m. So what we've shown is that, let's go back, what we've shown, uh, lemma or something, when you automorphize a function and you take its mth Fourier coefficient on the circle, it's the same, it's exactly the same as the mth Fourier coefficient of the original function on the real line. Okay, this is, I don't think this is immediately obvious. Once you get used to this, then it becomes sort of, Yes, it becomes immediately obvious, but it takes a minute to make sense of this. Okay, these are two different Fourier transforms. It's not just not just changing a letter, capitalizing a letter, right? So these are two different Fourier transforms, and yet their values are equal. Okay, so now what do we what have we shown? We have our f of x, which on one hand was defined to be the automorphization of little f, n in z. On the other hand by Fourier analysis on the circle, much easier Fourier analysis than uh, on, the on the line. This is f hat of m e to the minus two pi i mx. And we just showed that this is equal to that. So this is a sum over m in z, little f hat 
of m e to the minus two pi i mx. And now what? For those that haven't seen this before. Set x equals zero. Set x equals zero. What's that? Oh, you have seen it before? Uh, so if we set x equal to zero, then x is zero here it gives us f of n. It came back to you. You were inspired. I said x equal to zero here. Again, this is trivial. This is a character. So this trivializes, and we get a sum over m in z f hat of n. How else do you get rid of? Yeah. We need to get rid of the exponent. We need to get rid of the shift. And one this one thing does it both. Okay, so it's a very, very simple theorem these days, plus on summation. Is there any reason why you'd want to use this in a more general form? You mean the, uh, the adelic form? No, I just mean like without setting x equal to zero. Oh, uh, there is a more general form that we that we'll do right now that's very useful. Um, the like, x. Oh, I want the half. You know, that's exactly what I need. Well, actually, we saw this already when we were taking Fourier transforms. We saw a version of this already. When we were taking Fourier transforms of, uh, let, let me write it down, recall, just as an, this is an aside, an aside, recall that the Fourier transform of the indicator function of, a, of something like a plus p to the n z p. You remember what that is? Let's say at c. Everything gets an exponential uh -huh. and an indicator function. Yeah, the p-adic exponential of uh, a times c. And, and then an indicator. A minus. P minus a n z p uh, of c. Hmm. So addition, in other words, translation, turns into multiplication by by a twist. Say that again. Here we're shifting. We're shifting the values of c by some random uh, point a in qp, and the output on the other side is a twist, a rotation. Look here. We're shifting. On that side, you get a rotation. Okay, it's not an accident. This is this is what always happens. But here we get it sort of as a, even as a sum. Okay, but there's something even better that we can do. So let's uh, fix some t, let's say positive, and let's think about what happens to f if we use the multiplicative action of f. We have this ring we can add, but we can also multiply. Let f sub t of x be defined to be f of x times t. So we can additively translate x and then the Fourier transform gets a, a twist or we can multiplicatively translate f let's see what happens to the Fourier transform so what is the Fourier transform of f sub t you want to work this out did Nick already show you this last week <laughs> okay you want to take a minute and work on it or should we just do it together Nobody's working on it. Okay, let's do it together. All right. So what's the definition? I just take ft, uh, ft. Well, I'll, uh, there's a t here that I'm going to put there by by what we're supposed to do there, and e to the two pi i c x dx. Now this is the additive Haar measure. It's not the multiplicative Haar measure. It's the additive Haar measure. And so when I make a change of variables, y equals x times t. T is positive. It doesn't do anything to the, the integral over the real line. F becomes a function of Y. E to the 2 pi I C. Uh, instead of X, I have Y over T. And instead of DX, DY is equal to DX times T. So DX is DY over T. Everybody see that? And so when I... When I apply a multiplicative shift to f, what happens to the Fourier transform is that it's the Fourier transform. What is this? There's a one over, there's a factor of one over t 
in front. And then there's a Fourier transform, not at C, but at C over T. Everybody see that? This is the Fourier transform. There's a one over T and then the Fourier transform at C over T of the original function. So if you apply Poisson summation to the function FT, so FT of N summed over N in Z is equal to FT hat of M summed over M in Z, but FT hat summed over M in Z is a sum over M in Z of this Fourier transform. So there's a factor of one over T and uh, F hat of M, I'm applying this to M, M over T. Whereas here, F sub T of N is a sum over N in Z. Can you guys not see? Uh, F of N times T. So here's, here's a slightly generalized, a different kind of generalization, not by, by having an additive shift in the N, which gives me a twist here, but a multiplicative shift, a multiplicative uh, factor here, which has an opposite multiplicative effect on that side with a rescaling. Now, there's if you understand one thing, understand that how powerful this formula is. Let's apply this formula to, uh, let's try uh, f of x is the Gaussian, e to the minus pi x squared. This is my normalization for a Gaussian because what's its Fourier transform? It's like a one over root two pi, something, something. In this case, the way I've normalized it, it's, it's just itself. Okay, exercise. If you don't already know this, remind yourself how to do this calculation. It's not that hard. Okay, so let's try applying this formula to this function with t equals um, one over a thousand. One over a thousand. Okay, so this side says if I sum over all the integers, uh, I don't think so. Do you need me to? I can. E to the minus pi x squared, right? That's what the, that's what our function is, x squared. So that's n over a thousand, n over a thousand squared. Okay, so if you were to evaluate this, I mean, this is obviously very, very rapidly convergent series. As soon as uh, this exponent is like of size one, it immediately dies after it. Okay, so when does this, at which value of n does this reach size roughly one? Was it? Oh, I thought I thought I heard somebody say something. Yeah, yeah. So this takes about a thousand terms on the order of a thousand terms until uh, every other term contributes nothing. Literally, you're not changing the decimal at all until until you've converged to a value. Converged to a value, right? On the order, roughly. You don't like it? Pi equals one. That's fine. Pi equals one. Yes. <laughs> okay on the order of a thousand terms 2001 terms plus and minus zero right zero gives us that with the term n equals zero gives us a one 2023 i like it okay take 2023 terms symmetrically and i guarantee you the rest of the terms will be completely negligible you'll never there's no calculator that will see the difference between adding them or not adding them Right. On the other hand, let's look at this sum. So the other side of it, which is supposed to be equal, is one over t, that's a thousand, times a sum over m and z, e to the minus pi times n c squared. C is m over t. Well, that's a thousand times m. Yes. But how many terms until this one stops being stops giving any contribution? If m is one, I have e to the minus pi times a thousand square. You will, th that number is zero. It's just zero. Okay. So as soon as m is anything other than zero, the sum is done. This has one term. 
the thing that it sums to, the thing that this sums to, that you are going to take a thousand terms, 2023 20, terms to calculate, I can calculate with one term, m equals zero. Uh, so, so not roughly. I mean, yes, roughly, <laughs> but but like plus an error of you know ten to the minus I don't know ten to the ten or something. <laughs> really, it's like you know at least one over a Google. Uh, right, this is too big. To, yeah, bigger than the Zyber cost. Yes, the biggest integer that exists. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so this is the power of a formula like this. This is one power, one bit of uh, power of a formula like this. It allows you to take long sums, and if the sum really is long, it allows you to convert it to a much, much shorter sum. With, uh, you know, it gives the right answer. So it, it can't just uh, there has to be something to compensate that for that. But that's what this one over t is doing. Okay, so the answer really is a thousand. Here you would approach that thousand one one step at a time, and here you just do it immediately, one term down. Okay, now, fine, the formula is kind of cute, but why do you, you know, what's the real power of a formula like this? Like in theory. It, in in theory and in application. One term is a lot easier to sum than One term is a lot easier to sum than a whole bunch, but we get something even more out of this formula because, you know, this is supposed to be somehow a number theory course. None of this, so far, we haven't done any number theory. So let's get the analytic continuation of the zeta function. And then we'll go back through all of these calculations, and you will see that when I replace G or R by Adele's, and I replace Z so you're or gamma. Like entirely right now, and then you're going to do the Adele's That's right. Equation. That's right. There's one thing that we can't see when we do uh, what we're about to do for the for zeta, which is that we don't. We have to have a separate argument that tells us the uh, Euler product. You mean for the Adele's? No, no, we're, we're, we're about to, we're about to figure out how this, how this Poisson summation formula gives us uh, the Riemann zeta function, right. not the Euler zeta function, right? The, the analytic continuation of functional equation of the zeta function. What it doesn't give us is uh, for free, it doesn't immediately tell us uh, the Euler product, form, which when we do adelically, that's the one thing that we pick up without any extra work. Well, the extra work is that we build up the theory of Adelic integration. Yeah, I think I know. Okay, so this is a mixture. So we're we're about to mix uh, the additive Fourier transform with a multiplicative Fourier transform. The multiplicative Fourier transform. Uh, anybody other than most of you know what a, what the multiplicative Fourier transform is called? Have you heard of this thing called a Mellon transform? Okay, so some of you have heard of the Mellon transform. Some of you haven't. Let me remind you what a Mellon transform is. Is it too many transforms? Too many transforms. Um, this one's not bad. Well, there's going to be adelic versions of, of, of a bunch of things. So, but what's a, okay, let's remember what's a Fourier transform. Okay, hang on. Before we go to Mellon, what's a Fourier transform? Okay, you have your group G, G is R. You have your har measure, d, d mu, har measure is just Lebesgue measure dx. You have a character, you have a character, which is e to the 2 pi i uh, c x, or e to the 2 pi i x. And, you're, and the Fourier transform is you take your f, you multiply by the character, e to the 2 pi i x c, you integrate with respect to har measure over the real numbers, that's a Fourier transform. Okay, let's do exactly the same thing, but with a different group. That's called a Mellon transform. Mellon transform. That's right. They, one, one can be gotten from the other. The group will be the multiplicative real numbers. So that's not a connected group. So let me just take the connected component. So the positive multiplicative real numbers. We remember what uh, Haar measure is in this case. What's the measure of this invariant? Dx over x, exactly. And what's a character? So now I have the multiplicative real numbers. Have we talked about this? I think we have. No, maybe not. Not in this class, really. But we did it. We sort of did it uh, for, oh, we just computed the integral. But we didn't talk about the fact that when you take the p adic absolute value and raise it to the s power, that is a multiplicative character. OK. So, uh, so observe that if I send x 
if I map x to x to a power for a complex number uh, s, traditionally it's called s after Riemann, uh, that this is a character. <laughs> what? what? That wasn't meant to be funny. <laughs> after Riemann's memoir, yes. Riemann used s. <laughs> You know, Z is like you learn complex analysis and in complex analysis, Z is X plus I, Y. And then you get to number theory and it's just S. It's only S. S is your complex number. That's because of Riemann. Yes, not that, not that this is named for Riemann. Because of Riemann's memoir. Okay, so this is a character. It's obviously a character, right? I multiply X, X times Y, then X to the S times Y to the S is X, Y to the S. Okay, so it's a character into the, it's not necessarily unitary. It's not necessarily giving me numbers on the complex unit circle, but nevertheless, uh, well, it would be if S was purely imaginary. The absolute value, if X is real the absolute, and positive, the absolute value, so that we don't have to worry about what it means to exponentiate a uh, negative number or worse yet a complex number, right? We're not so doing three months surfaces. Well, we wanna choose all of them. You see, we, we want all of them. That's what this ranging over C is. So we're, we're gonna make a function of S just like we're making a function of C here. So our function, so this is called the Mellon transform of our function is you take your function, it's a function on the positive real numbers. So we'll integrate on the positive real numbers. We'll multiply by the character X to the S and we'll integrate with respect to the par measure. And that's exactly what the Mellon transform is. It's exactly the same thing as a Fourier transform. And in fact, you can go back and forth between the two, uh, make the change, what's the change of variables that makes the group R into the group. What's the homomorphism from the additive real numbers to the multiplicative? Uh, yeah, exactly, exponentiation. Yeah, so another exercise, change variables, change variables, uh, what is it? X is equal to E to the Y, which takes the multiplicative numbers to the additive numbers and uh, to, to C, to see Mellon as a special case, as, as a version of as a version of Fourier, or vice versa. And vice versa. Okay, so we built up this multiplicative uh, uh, group structure, multiplicative uh, Haar measure on all the p-adics. We're gonna these things are all gonna come back. Um, okay, so that's what a Mellon transform is. And here's the interesting thing to do, okay? Here's the interesting thing to do. This, this is uh, Riemann's memoir uh, after... Um, we're going to apply, we're gonna take this formula, the Mellon transform, and we're going, uh, with the Poisson summation formula, and we're going to apply, um, we're gonna take the Mellon transform of this formula with T as the variable. Remember T was a positive number. This is this was for T positive and T is acting in a multiplicative way. Okay. And and hopefully you'll see what, what will come out. Let's let me make one simplifying uh, assumption, which is that assu let's assume that our test function F is even. If it's even, that allows me to write this formula. What? You can tell us. No, okay, you'll tell us later. Wait, wait, go with it, go with it. This is Optimus Prime. <laughs> And then uh, the is, uh, the Decepticons. Decepticons. I don't know enough about transformers. Wait, Mellon transform is what? Bumblebee? Yeah. Okay, this is. <laughs> They're both Decepticons. Laplace and Hank All right. I, I, my, my, uh, yeah. I was too old for this and my kids are too young. So that this transformers aren't in my wheelhouse, but. You know, if you want, uh, I don't know what I'm asking questions here. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> um, let's assume F is even. Then I can fold the, then, okay, exercise. Then so is F hat. It's a trivial uh, exercise. 
And I can fold the sum over all integers just into the positive integers. That'll allow us to analyze things a little bit more uh, easily. So this, this means that if I take, I've, there's nothing I can do about f of zero, that's its own beast. But then when I sum over the positive integers, I get twice. So twice the sum of the positive integers plus the value at zero will we'll recover the value of, of all of the, um, the naturals. And I want to do the same thing on the other side. One over t, f hat, when m is equal to zero, I still get zero. And then I get twice the sum over the positive integers m, f hat, m over t, and I've lost the one over t sum. I lost you? No, no, you're good, you're good. Okay. So this thing, this sum over n is what I'm gonna call a theta function, theta function. A theta function classically arose in uh, some other related contexts, but um, a theta function of t, which is now a function t is in, I'm thinking of t as a multiplicative in this, as an element of this group, the multiplicative real numbers. Given a test function f, I'm going to sum over the naturals f of n times t, just the positive, uh, positive integer. Just, uh, just about, uh, an aside, right? This is sort of like, do you later do things like Dirichlet characters with like a delicate? Yes, you will see that the GL1 automorphic representations over Q are nothing but. Uh, Dirichlet characters. Well, Dirich like twisted Poisson like we will prove Poisson. that. We will prove all of the Poisson formulas in one fell swoop and and uh, all of the L functions, all of the Dirichlet L functions. Their functional equations, their Euler products, all of that will come out That's from, from studying Adels and, and Edels. So you see how this is like an Edel, this T. The, we're studying the multiplicative group even though it embeds, it, it interacts with the additive group and the additive Fourier transform. Okay, so it's this interaction of multiplication and addition that, uh, that allows us these things. Okay, so we have this function. It's a function now, does this function make sense? Can, does this converge? I assume that F was rapidly convergent uh, at infinity. So at infinity, we have like, you know, pretend it's a Gaussian. We have exponential decay. So this F, this theta f of t has rapid decay as t goes to infinity. What about as t goes to zero? I also have rapid decay, right? Wait a second. No, this is getting closer and closer to f of zero. Now I'm summing infinitely many f of zeros. That doesn't look like it's going to converge. We have a problem at zero. Oh, wait a second, I can just look at it here. So this function, if I think about t going to zero, if I add a constant to it, whatever this constant is, I get a function on this side. Now, when t goes to zero here, I do have rapid decay because I'm dividing by t. That's the same as multiplying by a huge number. F hat also is, is also Schwartz. So this has rapid decay, rapid decay, rapid, it's more rapid than the blow up of one over t here. Nice, like, nice little positive instead of like a, that's right. Doing our cross, you know. Well, then we'd have to deal with the positives and negatives separately. Yeah. Not only that, like the convergence thing is like you mean specifically going from like positives down to zero. Yes. Yes. Here. And instead, yeah. like otherwise, you have to like. Either, yeah, it's a little. It's a minor know, nuisance. It's, yeah, it's not a serious nuisance. It's a minor nuisance. If I didn't make this function even, then we'd have to deal with both sides. But yeah, but, but so I have rap, so I have a constant here. I have rapid decay here. Teddy, you don't like something. This thing, this thing's blowing up. So it is, it has to be blowing up. I'm adding up the F of zero infinitely often. So it blows up, it grows, grows like one over T. Okay. Not only that, but it's actually bounded by uh, one over t. It grows no worse than one over t as t, as t goes to zero. Okay, at infinity, there's no problem at all. As t goes to zero, yes, we have a slight problem. It's blowing up, but maybe that's going to be integral against something. Okay, so let's keep that in mind when we try to take the Mellon transform of this thing. So let's try to compute the Mellon transform. 
again, this is this is Riemann's big observation uh, that we're doing kind. I mean, Riemann did it with an explicit function f, namely the Gaussian. Uh, we're going to do it, it in the general sense of test functions, and you'll see how the same thing pops out. So I have this function theta f. It's a function on the positive reals. I'm going to take its Mellon transform of s if I can make sense of it. Remember the formula for a Mellon transform. It's just a multiplicative Fourier transform. It's right here. So I'm going to take the original function. What does this mean? I take the original function theta of x. I multi or, or t. You want to make it t? Let's make it t. What is s? S is a complex number, but we're going to have more. We are going to have more restrictions on it in just a second. At the moment, this is a formal. I'm just writing down the formal formula. Over the positive reals, the character is t to the s, and Haar measure is dt over t. Now let's ask Teddy's question: For which values of s can we? Does this thing converge absolutely? Okay, so I have this is blowing up like one over t. This also has a one over t. At infinity, there's no problem. This is just a polynomial. Everything else is polynomial, and I have rapid decay in theta. So at infinity, there's no problem, no issues. Here, theta is like one over t. There's a t to the s, and there's another one over t from the Haar measure. Well, s equals two will make it uh, not blow up, but I can integrate things that blow up as long as they don't blow up faster than one over t. One over t is not integrable at zero. But anything less than that is. So actually, I don't need real part of s to be bigger than two. I just need it to be bigger than one. So as long as the real part of s is bigger than one, I do have absolute convergence. So far, so good. I got the extra t from the fact that theta blows up at zero. Theta blows up at zero. So I have to be. I have to be worried about that. It would be zero if I was just bounded at zero, but I'm not. I'm actually blown up. Okay, so far so good. This is supposed to be motivation for what we're going to be doing. Uh, hopefully, it seem like interesting. Yeah, you should need the whole thing. So right, so that people see where it's going, because not everybody knows where yeah. where this thing is going. Okay, well, we have an integral. What are we going to do? Remember what this theta function is. Find yeah, we're gonna get two sums. We're gonna swap them exactly. So let's open the the definition of theta. It's a sum over positive integers f of n times t. Then I have a t to the s dt over t. So far so good. Joy, what are we gonna do? Swap, swap them. with them. All right, we have to swap them. By the way, so now. This, uh, these integrals, I mean, we're in the range of uh, absolute convergence. We have to check that we're in, we're in this region of absolute convergence. There we can swap. So when we swap, we get n greater than equal to one, integral from zero to infinity. Okay, f of n times t, t to the s, dt over t, I'll make a change of variables. Let, um, I want to get rid of this n and just make uh, y equal to n times t. Okay, it's a change of variables in t. So dy <clears throat> is n for a fixed n times dt. Okay, so uh, dt is not invariant under multiplication by that. But dt over t, if I divide both of these by this formula, dy over y divided by n times t is dt over t. Par measure, right? That's why we have this. It's multiplicative par measure when multiplying. We're applying the multiplicative action on the positive integers, not arbitrary. Okay, so what do we get? A sum over n greater than one, integral from zero to infinity. You'll see it's exactly the same principle that we used in the unfolding argument. F of y, right? So the multi multiplying by a positive integer doesn't change the integral over the, the positive reals. T to the s becomes y over n to the s, y over n to the s, dt over t remains dt, dt over t, dy over y. Okay, so let's let's keep track of what we're doing. We had absolute convergence, so we swapped. Then 
uh, change your variables in hard measure. Then this is a character. This is a character, the definition of a character. It's a multiplicative character. I have y times one over n to the s. That's just y to the s. So here I get an integral of y to the s dy over y times n to the minus s, which of course pulls out of the integral. So this is the multiplicative character. I hope this is familiar. And now look, this has no n's in it. And this has no f's in it. They completely separate. This is the Mellon transform of f. This is the zeta function, zeta of s. Okay, I guess I haven't defined zeta of s, but uh, there it is. That's the definition of, the, of this thing. Right? Are you going to need the common function? Sure. Yeah, let's make a comment about historically how, how this was done, not with test functions, arbitrary test functions here. But uh, so, yeah, maybe I should have done that way back, back there. What is, so here's the question, uh, what is the Mellon transform of the, this Gaussian e to the minus pi x squared? Should we do this computation? It's not very hard. F tilde of s is by definition integral from zero to infinity. F of x is e to the minus pi x squared. The, um, what's the character, multiplicative character? x to the s, R measure, dx over x. Okay, what the hell is this thing? I don't know. Well, let's make a change of variables. y is equal to pi x squared. Now, is this an invertible change of variables in the positive real numbers? As x ranges over all the positive real numbers, I have to divide by pi, I have to take the square root. No problem, positive real numbers. Okay, so this is an invertible change of variables. It's great we're not dealing with negative real numbers. It's great that we're not dealing with negatives, yes. No, you would just do them, so they don't interact with one another. So that's why. Uh, what about dy? dy is uh, pi times 2x dx. Hmm. That's not going to be invariant, is it? Let me divide both sides by y. Here I'll divide by y. Here I'll divide by pi x squared. Oh, would you look at that? There's a factor of two, nothing I can do about that, but otherwise it's the same dx over x. So even squaring, this, this harm measure is like too good. Even squaring, it's almost uh, invariant. It's just a constant factor. Okay, so let's see what we get. So this f tilde of s, is an integral, again, this continues to range from zero to infinity, instead of e to the minus pi x squared, I have e to the minus y. x, what is x? x is y over pi square root to the power s. There's the square root. Right? And then dx over x has turned into one half dy over y. That two is a is going to the other side. It's a character. This is a character. So the one half stays. I have an integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus y. There's a y to the s over two, and there's a pi to the s over, two, well, one over pi to the s over two that pulls all the way outside, pi to the minus s over two. And dy over y is still here. What is this Mellon transform? I'm defining things as I go. <laughs> the smell and transform is, if you were to give it a name and ask Euler what he wants to call it, mm -hmm. it's the gamma function, it's the gamma function. In fact, the exponential function, there's a, there's a Mellon pair. I didn't tell you what Mellon inversion is, but the gamma function is defined as the 
if you've seen, some people have seen the wrong definition of the gamma function, which looks like this. That's the wrong definition of the gamma okay. function. This is not the gamma function. That, that, I don't know what to do with what that is. That's it. No, this is the gamma function. It's e to the minus y times y to the s times dy over y. That's the gamma function. It's the Mellon transform of the exponential. That's all. That's right. That's even worse. Yeah. S divided by two that sort of stopped existing. Well, no, it's still just s over two. This is the gamma function at s over two. Okay. So this, uh, so this thing, this one half pi. So let's just put it here. One half pi to the minus s over two gamma of s over two. You'll see people write this as zeta infinity of s, the factor that completes the zeta function, so that you get uh, something with a nice functional equation. But of course, the reason they write zeta infinity is because they they are thinking adelically, and this is what will happen when we do an adelic integral. But actually, this has so you don't have to use the exponential function as your test function. If you use any test function, already you'll get the zeta function and then the smell and transform. Now, okay, that's just, that doesn't actually prove anything. All it does is uh, give a formula for the product of zeta with some Mellon transform in terms of, uh, Mellon transform of a test function f in terms of a Mellon transform of a theta function, right? Let's just review what we've done. What, um, what did you call the Yes, when I when I did this to it, uh, when I took the capital F, yeah. I automorphized. It's not quite right because. Here, automorphization means I have something that's automorphic. Automorphic means auto more same mo motion. So here's the auto yeah, it's automorphic. It's periodic. Automorphic automorphic is a fancy word for periodic. Yeah. <laughs> right. But periodic can mean very uh, like you know they're they're weird non uh, abelian groups with which we want things to be periodic. So instead of saying periodic, we say automorphic. I mean the the language came from you know Klein and uh, Fuchs and, and people like this. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, periodize. Yeah, periodize. So, the theta function is periodizing. The theta function is not periodizing because we're, um, we're multiplying by n. And what is the theta function invariant under? I'm just multiplying by n and summing. The, the natural numbers don't, don't form a multiplicative uh, group, the positive naturals. Right, so this isn't invariant under anything interesting. So this is—I wouldn't call this periodized. Is there a version of polynomial um, that Well, what would it look like? You would uh, you would multiply over the powers of you would you like multiply over the powers of a single element, right? What are the what are the additive subgroups of R cross? The multiplicative subgroups of of R cross. It's like you take a single lambda, you take all of its powers. Uh, and you try to sum over that. So it really is, we're breaking some of the symmetry. We're playing the multiplicative act. Exactly. We're forcing the addition to interact with multiplication in ways that it didn't want to at first, and out pops the Riemann zeta. So let's just recall what we're doing. Uh, sorry? Is it co-cycle? Change my mind. Love it. Love it. Recall. So there were there was a twisted there was not twisted this is a Poisson summation formula or slightly you know sub, slightly generalized Poisson summation formula, which said that the sum of a function of n times t summed over n and z was a sum that's not a sum that's a sum uh, of f hat at m over t m in z with this factor one over t. We had that identity, which actually we wrote out as a slightly different version f of zero plus twice, uh, I can now write theta f of t, theta f of t being a sum over the positive integers f of nt. I'm, I'm probably going too fast. I'm going fast because we're gonna do all of this again slowly, but there's no point in going fast now. In fact, I can go fast later 
when we're doing it again, if I go slow enough now that everybody really understands what, what's happening here. I'm probably doing it the wrong way. Um, well, you guys tell me if I should slow down. Uh, plus two over T, a sum over positive M's of F hat of M over T. Of course, this thing we can also write as a theta function. It's a theta function with test function F hat. And uh, instead of T, this is at the argument one over T. Okay, so this is a kind of functional equation for the theta function, that the values of t are related to the values of one over t. And what we just computed, what we computed in the range where the real part of s is greater than one is that the Mellon transform of the theta function is the classical Riemann zeta function. Or the, let, me, let me try to be careful with my language. This is not what I would call the zeta function. It's just the Euler zeta function times the Mellon transform of your test function. We haven't learned anything yet. We, have, we don't have analytic continuation. We don't have a way of expressing the zeta function on all the complex numbers. And we don't have a functional equation. Both of those things come immediately from this identity. Poisson summation is the zeta function. Okay, let's see why. So let's return to this formula. This is the integral from zero to infinity the theta function at t, t to the s, dt over t, right? This is just, again, the standard identity, right? The definition of Mellon Our problem with the theta function is at zero. At infinity, this thing is beautiful. So let's break the integral as an integral from one to infinity, where now we really do have an entire function of s. Uh, theta f t t to the s dt over t plus an integral from zero to one. This thing is entire as a function of s in s. But this thing we have to deal with. Okay, so let's think about that other half. So it's an integral from zero to one of this theta function, of this theta function, t to the s dt over t. It's hard for me to see what's going on with the theta function near zero from its definition. So I'm going to use this identity. This identity says that twice this theta plus that is that, uh, let's see. So what can I do? Uh, twice that theta, so if I divide both of these by two, I get a one over t, uh, uh, this theta, theta of f hat at one over t, Okay, that's on this side. Can you guys see that? There's a plus f hat of zero over two t, because I'm dividing by two. And there's a minus f of zero also divided by two. If I move that to the other side. Do you agree with this, this integral from zero to one is this thing? So far, so good. These parts, I can just compute these integrals directly. So I have an integral that I'll deal with in a second. Um, plus, okay, so what do I have here? I have a plus f hat of zero divided by two times, what is this? S t to the s over t squared. So this is a t to the s minus two. So that's the antiderivative of that is t to the s minus one over s minus one, evaluated from zero to one. Okay, so that's this, this little part of the integral goes here. And a minus f of zero over two, that's this part, that's getting multiplied by t to the s over t to the s minus one, the antiderivative of which is t to the s over s, and that's being evaluated from zero to one. Did I do that too fast or is that okay? Okay, so that's these two bits going over here. So maybe this is a double arrow, double arrow. So far, so good. Now what's going on with this first thing? Um, I have one over t's everywhere. Let me replace t by one over t. So let y equal one over t. I'm gonna make that change of variables. Okay, what's dy? 
This is t to the minus one, so that's minus t to the minus two dt. Uh, let me do this change of variable where I have room. Uh, let me copy and paste it because I know I'm going to have to delete stuff. Why is the change variable okay at zero? Why is the change of variable okay at zero? Well, it's um, just a second. I have to concentrate to do this and then I can answer your question. Okay. Why is the change of variable okay at zero? Well, it's okay at zero in the same way. I mean, this is a limit as t goes to zero. So we're going to we're going to get a limiting formula that's going to be in terms of y going to infinity. I think you've also had a problem at... Yeah, I don't have a problem at at 0, but I uh, I'm sorry, at 1, but I certainly have a problem at 0. I mean, it's going to just it's just going to be an integral out to infinity. Okay? Is this clear so far? I've just uh, taken this uh, change of variables. Now I'm going to divide both sides by y. I'll divide this by y and I'll divide this by y. And lo and behold, love this Haar measure, it's negative d uh, t over t. We already confirmed that raising t to a power is just multiplied by the power. By the power. Yes, very good. Very good. But we're not integrating over the entire real line anymore. We're only integrating from zero to infinity. So when I replace y equals one over t, at one, I still get one. At zero, I get infinity. So now I get an integral from infinity to one. And this minus sign will let me flip that to make it an integral from one to infinity, dy over y, using that minus sign to change the order. Then a one over t, well, let's put the theta function first. So this is a theta of f hat at not one over t, but at y. And then what do I have? I have a t to the s minus one. So that's a y to the one minus s. And that's it. So wait a second, let's put all of this together. So if I go back to the Mellon transform of theta, in fact, let me put it, give myself just a little bit of room. Okay, so I go back to the Mellon transform of theta. I have this entire function, which is an integral from one to infinity, theta of f of t, times t to the s dt over t. That's just the original integral. I have another very similar looking integral. It's an integral from zero, from one to infinity, not from zero, from one to infinity of theta hat, theta of f hat at t or y times t to the one minus s dy over y dt over t. And both of these are are perfectly uh, convergent integrals. Okay, so this thing is entire, entire in S. And then I have this junk left over. Let's see what the left over. The first term was the original. We, we were evaluating the integral from zero to one. We broke the integral as one to infinity and zero to one. Okay, so let, let's look at the second part. When t is equal to zero, I get nothing. When t is equal to one, I just get one over S minus one. So I get a plus f hat of zero over two times s minus one. And I'm gonna change the sign to a minus and make the s minus one into one minus s. And here I just have a minus f hat of zero over two. Again, when t is equal to zero, t to the s doesn't contribute. When t is equal to one, t to the s is one. So I get one over s. First term should be plus, plus f hat of zero. It is a plus with an s minus one. No, no, when t is equal to one, oh. this is as t goes from one. Right, 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 right. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. When t is equal to zero, I get nothing. When t is equal to one, I just get a one over s minus one. It's not an s, it's in, yeah, it's in t. Okay. On the other hand, I get zeta of s times f hat of s, f tilde, f uh, mel melon transform of f. This is entire in s. This is, you know, it, it defined, I mean, this is just one over s. It's a function one over s. So this is fine as long as s is not equal to zero or one. 
And if you can find a nice function, which is, well, if you have a smooth function, then it's melon transform is going to be entire anyway, which you can check. So this is the analytic continuation. This is the Riemann zeta function. Now, now we can call this the Riemann. I, I call this the Riemann zeta function. What are the first quality functions? The first equality? Yeah, this is just evaluating, just evaluating this Mellon transform. Just this was only true if the real part of S is greater than one. But but this thing is now giving us analytic continuation. So the Riemann zeta function is the function one over F tilde of S times this whole monstrosity. I don't even have to point to it, nor do I have to rewrite it again. Times this whole monstrosity. That is the Riemann zeta function, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. The first, one is entire. the first term is entire. This only has problems at zero and one. Now it's up to you to. This is, in fact, this a continuum of Riemann zeta functions. It doesn't. It's independent of the choice of the test function, right? Yeah. For any, any nice, nice f, we get this. But of course, they're all the same. This is something that's not dependent on the test function. In the same way, I mean. Uh, same as, same as the fact that if you sum a function on the integers and you sum its Fourier transform on the integers, this is a function that's in, that's independent of the test one of the test function. This is the zero function, right? It's that's literally the same thing. It's hiding that same identity in a very fancy way. So this is the Riemann zeta function, and now we have analytic continuation. This gives us gives continuation of zeta from real part of s greater than one to s not equal to zero or one. Again, as long as you can find a nice function here, and you can, the gamma function is never uh, never vanishing, so you can divide by it. It has some poles, which gives the zeta function trivial zeros. And if you can find, if f is equal to f hat, if you can find a function that's its own transform, then you just stare at this formula and it's blatantly obvious that uh, then uh, zeta of s times f hat of s is invariant, invariant under s goes to one minus s. You just replace s by one minus s here and here and here and here, it's the same thing. As long as the the function is its own Fourier transform, which is the case for the Gaussian. So that is the power of Poisson summation combined with Mellon transform. And that's exactly what we're about to do with the Adels, Adelic Poisson summation, and then this integral over the Edels will will recover all of these facts and one more fact that we do not yet know about the zeta function, which is its other perfect form. Is the Gaussian the only thing with its own Fourier transform? Nope. And, and if you use a different one than the Riemann data from to get at the end, is the same? It has to be. Okay. That's weird. Okay. That's really weird. But it's not that weird when you remember what the Poisson summation formula is. That's, that's really weird. Yeah. Okay. It's it's as weird as the other thing. That's also weird. Okay. So this is, I, I you know. I'm not assuming you guys know any number theory. Hopefully, okay. I haven't motivated why you care about the zeta function. Um, <laughs> Oh, there's a famous hypothesis. There's a famous hypothesis. There's a million dollars, right? There's hopefully, uh, not that the money is, there's a much, much easier way to spend a million dollars. Uh, but hopefully, uh, I've motivated a little bit of where we're going. Why Why do we need Poisson summation on the, on the Adels? It's to be able to do stuff like this in great generality. And it's the same tricks over and over again. You already know all the tricks. That's it. If you followed these, these couple of calculations, this sort of reverse orders, yeah, reverse orders when you have some, use har measure, use the character, that's it. Just compute. Sums break apart. So that's that's what we're going to do uh, when we prove. First, we have to make sense of as. Uh, so that is uh, is special to the reals. 
you can't always take square roots. So that is something that's special, and it's only special in the sense of wanting to get a nice test function like the Gaussian to work. But you don't need the Gaussian. We did everything with, with abstract text functions. And here's an abstract. Well, would there be like a particular test function in the general case? It's actually better to, this is why I say this is Tate's thesis. Before Tate, people were always putting particular functions in. And Tate showed that, no, the right way to do it is to use abstract test functions. And the whole thing works. It comes out. So when we do it adelically, you'll see we just want to take test functions and the intervals will come out beautifully. 